I would say football taught me a lot of leadership qualities. I would say it really taught me sort of the power of leading by example. In football, this is the single strongest form of leadership. Right. The simple act of doing things the right way can have huge effects on the people around you. And really, this should be the first form of leadership. Welcome to the VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics Leadership Journey Podcast. This podcast aims to share leadership stories from our VMI Corps of Cadets and high-profile leaders who visit the Center for Leadership and Ethics and VMI Post. We're on this journey with you. Hi, I'm Derek Pinkham. And hey, I'm Emily Coleman, and we're your host of the podcast. John Urschel is a former NFL offensive lineman and mathematician currently working on his Ph.D. at MIT. He was the Center's Spring 2020 Courageous Leader Speaker. We spoke to him about his football and math careers, how they create similar leader opportunities, and bring him back to his first principle of leadership. We talk about decision-making, motivation, and his book, Mind and Matter. And without further delay, we give you John Herschel. John Urschel, thank you for coming. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thanks yeah, for being it. here. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Give us a little bit of background on you and, you know, what you're doing now. The short story of it is I'm a former NFL offensive lineman, current uh, MIT PhD student in mathematics. Wow. Yes. <laughs> I'm intimidated. <laughs> Okay, well, cool. Um, so our first question is, what was your motivation for pursuing both math and football? Right, because it seems incongruous in some ways. Yeah. yeah in, in some ways, yeah. but uh, in, in many ways, I think it's as natural as, as any two things, I should say. Right. I mean, I, right. Uh, really, it's a, it's a simple answer. Right. Because, okay, when I was, uh, when I was younger, I loved football. I yeah. mean, my, uh, my father played football, so when I was little... I would see pictures of him playing football. It made me want to play football. Mm-hmm. And then as far as math goes, I was uh, I was very late to sort of coming to really love math, but I will say that uh, ever since I was little, I really enjoyed the puzzles and problem solving yeah. and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so I oh. I was good at math, but I didn't nece- it didn't necessarily hook me until I got to university where I have to say it really it really took off for me. Like it really uh it became my passion. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Why why do you think that is? And that over football, I guess. Yeah. uh, Well, I would say I really enjoyed football more than math, even when I was at at Penn State. But uh, I would say my time at MIT really is where you were like over football. Yeah. uh, I have to say, doing math at MIT is a dream come true. Really? And just being able to be around all of these, uh, all of these brilliant mathematicians who are, yeah. who, you know, world renowned, and oh you know, every God. single week you have people visiting, mm-hmm. and it's uh, literally the world's most brilliant people visiting to come talk about whatever amazing contributions they've made. God. So it's just like an amazing environment that really made me appreciate just how beautiful math is. That's what we're trying to do with leadership: bring folks like you here. Yeah, the amazing <laughs> leadership skills that you guys. So, um, so did you have any mentors with math and or football? I would say yes to both. I mean, I had mentors and, you know, they were very much compartmentalized. I would say my math mentor was this mathematician at Penn State. He studied dynamical systems and he was the first person who really noticed me. Okay. Who, you know, he had me in class and he thought, wow, this is a strong math student Mm -hmm. and he wanted to help me. And so he's the person who actually introduced me to mathematical research. Okay. And so he was a big mentor for me. Um, with respect to football, just so many uh, older players at Penn State when I was younger in my career, just showing me how to be a successful football player. Right. Yeah, I was just a number of people. A number now, of people you can, you. you can look at that now and say it was their leadership, their mentorship that mm-hmm. helped me. Did you think of that then, or were you just too, too in it to, to... Too in it to notice. Yeah. yeah. I mean... In football, okay, uh, you know, you notice that, you know, older guys help younger guys. This right. is a natural thing. But I would mm-hmm. say for my uh, for my math professor, it wasn't until later on that I came to really appreciate what he did for me in the following sense. So mm-hmm. this guy, he, uh, he got his Ph.D. from Princeton. He was a professor at Caltech, and he had a two-body problem. And so uh, Maryland eventually, you know, paid him some more money and also helped his two-body problem. Then... Uh, Penn State sort of like outbid Maryland, and that's how yeah. he came to be uh, it. I'm, I'm assuming two-body problem means a math problem. 
this is something that uh, like significantly impacts where people work. Oh, mm-hmm. interesting. Because you're both academics, right. so you want to both place at the same university or both place sure. right. Right. at two universities in the same town. Right. And so oftentimes, especially if one of the two of them is much stronger than the other, mm-hmm. it can be tough. Sure. And so it helps when a university, they want the big fish, mm-hmm. but then they, like, right. they, well, you know, they do something for the wife Boston's or the big, husband in right. many cases. Boston's a big helps. college town, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my uh, so my professor, you know, a lot of his movements had to do with the two body problem. Right. And uh, but he was, uh, you know, very brilliant professor, and he had absolutely nothing to gain from helping me. Mm-hmm. What am I doing for this guy? I mean, I'm an undergrad. I don't really know that much math. Right. There's no benefit to him. So he's very altruistic. Yeah, there's absolutely no benefit to the point where, you know, he's spending all this time, he's emailing me questions, answering questions I have, he's spending all this time with me. I eventually write a paper sort of about the things we've been doing, about the things we've been talking about, about the things I've been working on. He doesn't even put his name on. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, he really just was helping me because he was someone who loved math right, and understood the importance of fostering that in other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He just loved teaching, perhaps. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, that was sort of like one example where I didn't realize until after the fact, no, this guy is really doing this just to help me. Do you want to give us a quick synopsis of your book? Mind, mind and matter. Ma- mind and matter. Yeah. Mind and matter. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, mind over matter. Yeah, no, 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 no. Mind it's like and the, matter. Yeah. yeah, mind and matter. It's a it's a sly uh, Schrodinger <laughs> reference, but uh, <laughs> memoir about my my life up to a given point and about my experiences with football and my experiences with uh, with mathematics and how these things are grew together and how these things shape me as a person. Right. right. Well, and why was it important for you to write? Uh, the main reason why I felt it important for me to write is, you know, for better or worse, I realize that I'm someone who has a platform, mm-hmm. right? who has a, a microphone, so to speak, and most mathematicians don't get that. <laughs> and so I feel I have a responsibility to introduce the concept of being a mathematician, introduce math to a broader audience. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so originally the book was actually much more uh, math heavy. But uh, Penguin, the uh, the publisher, actually and rightly thought that that would do a disservice. Right. That and you really can't talk about one they, without the other. Right. Mm. And they know what they're doing. So. Yeah. No, <laughs> they, and they did know what they were doing. So. Awesome. Yeah. So you um, dedicated a whole chapter in your book to decision making, and when you retired from football mm-hmm. to take up math. So can you tell us how that process went for you? Yeah, of course. I think. I think it's a fundamental it's a fundamental skill that each of us needs to have the ability to when faced with a decision really weigh the pros and cons and really think rigorously about what you want to do for you know for an actual good reason not just because of how you feel on a given day right. or some such thing I think that's such a crucial skill and so for me when I retired it was something where I had to think about this it, I was thinking about it for for months and mm-hmm. months and weighing things pros and cons and uh, eventually just when I thought about it sort of from a very just a very fundamental and like r- rigorous point of view it sort of became actually obvious Mm. That like uh, Interesting. that retirement was the right thing because I looked at my life and I thought, well, what are the most important things to me right now? They're math at MIT, and they're raising my daughter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, okay, I've had a great football career. You know, I you know got to play at Penn State. Yeah. I got to like right. be an offensive lineman in the Big Ten. I got to play in the NFL. But football is not one of the two most important things in my life anymore. And in fact, my whole football career, I've had a fairly clean career. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, not many injuries, not much of anything. Do I really need to play another year when it's not my biggest priority? And given how, you know, just how serious of a game football is. Right. And I thought, no, this is this is not a good idea. It's, the things I was looking was, for was the to, process all in your head, or did you do you actually start writing it out on the on the blackboard? Mostly in my head, but uh, uh, talking to friends. Yeah, like I have been yeah. talking to friends for most of the off season, just getting opinions and right. sort of. Right. Was there any pressure to go one way or the other, or was it more um, just like what makes you happy? It was a little bit of pressure on some ends. I mean, for right. instance, my uh, my father was, you know, pro football. Right. He wanted me to play longer because he wanted me to play my next season mm-hmm. because after that I would have the chance to get a big contract. But uh, this wasn't necessarily, like, this. his reasoning didn't work for me because I already sort of knew that I needed to start to focus on math. Mm-hmm. And so it was between playing one more season or not playing at all. So the new contract thing didn't really matter to me. But uh, 
I mean, my wife was obviously pro math and like things mm-hmm. like that. And, yeah. pro, pro healthy John. Pro healthy John. Uh, yeah. I have to say that I am, I am a fairly fairly healthy John at the Good. moment. Is, is she a mathematician? No, no. She uh, she's a writer. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, writer. very cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, what unique leadership qualities do you think that math and football have brought you, or that you've discovered on your journey, or maybe one? brought you more than the other? I would say football taught me a lot of leadership qualities. I would say it really taught me sort of the power of leading by example. In football, this is the single strongest form of leadership. Right. The simple act of doing things the right way can have huge effects on the people around you. And really, this should be the first form of leadership. Right. Because any other form, if you aren't doing that first part, this is useless. Right. This is, this is just lip service. And so I would say that is the biggest thing. It's not what you said it's what you do Mm -hmm. and when you're doing the right things people notice and okay conditional on doing that then there are finer things like Mm -hmm. just sort of noticing teammates who need help giving advice to younger players or younger people in whatever endeavor you're in finding the right way to talk to each specific person because one technique of this is how I handle people this is how I deal with people doesn't work for everyone and so it needs to be adaptive all of this stuff this is icing on top of the very fundamental principle Mm -hmm. that the most effective form of leadership and the fundamental form of leadership is doing things the right way right love it I think we hear that a lot too yeah like if you are going to uh, tell someone how to do something you should be able to do it too and show them how to do it yeah. So. yeah, of course. Yeah, and that's uh, certainly in, in the core cadets. That certainly Absolutely. is prevalent. So what <laughs> is your specialty in math? Oh, oh, that's a... Uh, Can you give us the dummies version? And what, what do you want to do with that? Like, what do you see yourself oh, doing in the yeah. future with that? Do you see yourself... Well, you kind of are already a leader in the math field, but do you see yourself doing something more than that with people? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I see myself uh, becoming an academic. I think uh, I think I want to become a professor... I really enjoy research, and I, I enjoy teaching, and so I would. This is just something I'm looking forward yeah. to. My specialty is uh, sort of applied mathematics, okay. sort of using you know mathematical techniques to solve problems that relate to the real world, real world things, yeah. real world things. That's maybe right. maybe not necessarily in ways that I can relate to your specific life, sure. but actual real world problems right. that whether it's engineers or data scientists right. or computer scientists face. You you like to play chess as well, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that's that's <laughs> strong because mm-hmm. I wouldn't consider myself particularly good at chess, and I wouldn't say I spend that much time on it just because, okay, I, I spend so much time on math, right, spending sure. time with my daughter. Right. I would say chess is sort of very, very low on the totem pole. And if I compare how good I am at chess versus, like, math or football, it's like right, so, so it's f- orders of magnitude. I'm just a casual player. I don't, I really okay. don't do much. Okay, so uh, it looked like you almost had, like, master's level... Numbers. Skills. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm a strong club player, <laughs> but I uh, but also I haven't played. I don't think I've even played like twenty matches. Even. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I I, yeah. I don't play at all, and I. I don't, yeah, okay. I just don't do much. Okay, I, I, I thought but I looked, it's, I But it's something I enjoy. Yeah. But uh, I just really don't have the time for it. Uh, yeah. But okay. I think, I will say that, like, when I do have time for it, maybe, like, later in life, I think I will probably become a master. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of chess. Yeah, yeah, I will. Gosh. Yeah, when, when I have more time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is crazy. Yeah, I mean, a master in the, uh, like, uh, the national circuit, right. the U.S. circuit. Right, right. Uh, grandmaster, like, the, the international right. sort of circuit is... I mean, it, I don't think any, I can even think of anyone who sort of achieved that highest level of international right. without starting at a young age, <laughs> right. which I did not. Mm. Mm-hmm. When did you start playing chess? Uh, I mean, I learned how to was move it? the pieces when yeah. I was little, but oh, okay. I didn't really like start playing, playing until I was even my junior or senior year in college. Okay. Like that's when I started playing a little bit with friends and stuff. Right. It's a puzzle though, right? Yeah. Do you, do you look at it like that? Uh... I do, but that's not how you should look at it. Oh, uh, okay. And so this actually makes... You haven't hit on something... This actually, this hurts me in chess, I would say. Because I, I would say when I play chess, and maybe this is sort of another issue, is that uh, 
I don't always enjoy playing chess as much as I do like looking at a position and like analyzing and understanding. Right. Because chess, in many ways, when you're playing a game, you have to be very pragmatic. And a lot of players don't really care about you know what's the fundamental truth about this position. They just want to try to make a good move or make it complicated for their opponent or some such thing. And I really, I have a desire to understand a position, and that that is not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, as strange as that sounds. Yeah, no, I think Did I you use any of your math skills in football? Oh, I, oh, like, I get that question. Do you? Uh, okay, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, no, just, no, I'm so okay. intrigued by, like, it's, I don't know, just math and applying no. that to no, the real world. I wonder if you were, like, in your head, like... It's all kung fu. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> it's a natural question. No, I mean, it's definitely natural. That's why I get it all the time. Uh, I mean, I think, like, strong quantitative reasoning might help you with things like learning the playbook. Okay. It can help you pre-snap, like you can uh, analyze, you know, what people are doing, and maybe it helps you with, like, recognition. Mm -hmm. But uh, once the ball snapped, I'm, I'm not sure. Mm, you're it not does me any thinking favors. about math. No, okay. <laughs> that, that, goes, that goes on in the weight room. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yep. What would your advice be to somebody struggling in their leadership journey? Just taking this all back to leadership and you being a leader in the math field. Mm -hmm. um, what would you, whether it's, they're in the math field yeah. in their leadership journey or with, with any leadership mm -hmm. journey. And uh, can you define leadership journey for me uh, in a sort of more rigorous way? Like, I'm gonna let you or maybe do through that. an example. You're going to let me do that? Yeah, I'm going to let you yeah. do that. Um, Sort of uh, leadership is, is influencing others. Yes. Um, and your journey with that, I, 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 I would say, through through um, your academics, through football, mm -hmm. through through then uh, working on your PhD, uh, having a family, yeah. all those things. So the cadets here go through what's called a leader journey. Mm -hmm. So they basically start as followers and then they go into leading their peers and leading, then leading themselves and yeah, leading, leading themselves peers. um and right, then out right. out in the real world mm -hmm. leading others and right. how they got there is kind of you know what we try and touch on yeah. i would say and this goes back to what i said before i think the most important thing is if you're struggling on this journey go back to the fundamentals go back to making sure i am doing things correctly Make sure that you're setting a good example. Make sure you're doing this part because often this can be the sort of, at least in my experience in football and in other regimes, this is often one of the biggest problems that someone faces mm -hmm. on what we'll call, let's say, a leadership journey is that there's someone who has gotten into a position of leadership because of the things they've done, the, you know, things they've done, but somehow they lost that connection to the, the things that made them a leader in the first place right. and the fundamental things mm -hmm. that they did that set great examples for everyone else. And so when you lose that part, it can be it can be hard for you, it can be hard for others to respect your leadership in some right. sense. Yeah. Sure. So what does leadership mean to you, if you could define it? Yeah, uh, for me, leadership, well, first off, it's setting a good example for others. And then secondly, being a mentor to others so that they can improve and do things the right way. Right. Yeah. And I really think of it as this two-step thing. Mm -hmm. The Center for Leadership and Ethics would like to thank the following. Cadet Caleb Minus, Class of 2020, for the intro and backing music. Find more of his musical stylings on his Instagram page at Minus Official, M-Y-N-U-S Official. Colonel David Gray, United States Army Retired, Director of the PMI Center for Leadership and Ethics. And of course, as always, our podcast guests. Find this podcast and other Center for Leadership and Ethics programming information on the VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics website or try our YouTube channel. Follow the VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram accounts. See you next episode of The Journey. Thanks for tuning in.